it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here, and let's just get right to it. To the far right, General Manager of the Cleveland Indians, Chris Antonetti. In the middle, General Manager of the Los Angeles Angels, Jerry DePoto. And closest to me, from the Milwaukee Brewers, General Manager Doug Melvin. <laughs> so I guess what we'll do is I'll start off by asking each of the GMs here just their overall view of analytics, and not just analytics right now where they are, but where it's going in the future. Because to me, that's the next frontier. And I, I think the funny thing is, in today's generation, we think that analytics is a, it's a new edge. For, I mean, as far back as I can remember. I can remember being a, a kid flipping over my baseball card to see what Rod Carew hit last year. You're getting into the statistics. It's a statistically based game that uh, connects through the generations and it's going to continue to grow. There's a new edge to it every year. Like Kenny mentioned, uh, we're getting better and better as an industry in how we analyze defensive metrics. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. There's still a human eye element to it that needs to occur. But you know, as Chris alluded to, all the different components that allow you to make good decisions in putting a roster together need to be uh, equally balanced, addressed in as many ways as you can. If you're not analyzing all the information available to you, you're probably not making good decisions. Doug, how do you view it? I got released as a minor league player with the New York Yankees in 1978-79 season. I was offered a job to throw batting practice and help the uh, coaches with the Yankee staff at that time was Yogi Berra, Jim Hegan, Mickey Vernon. And Dick had give, given us this computer, the White Sox, Oakland, and the Yankees were the three teams. And I'm lugging around this big computer and had this printer and this big old box and I had to run down and pack it up every day and take it up to the press box and I'm sitting here trying to type in this stuff. This was 1979, so we've come a long ways from that and that was the charting. I said, wouldn't it be easier to just take crayons and the ruler and... <laughs> The, the ball was hit to right center field there. I'll remember that, where it was hit and that. But uh, we've come a long way since then. And then and later on, I had to, uh, the, the uh, opportunity to work with the Baltimore Orioles for a couple years with Earl Weaver. And I thought Earl Weaver had one of the great minds in baseball. He was a guy that he didn't, you know, he wanted 27 outs swinging the bats. And I know there's some of them out there. He didn't like the sacrifice bunt. And I think we missed Earl Weaver. I just was talking the other day. Earl Weaver retired at the age of 56. He probably should have managed another 10 years and we all could have been more educated. He used a lot of the, the metrics, but in his own mind, the thing with Earl was he didn't broadcast it. He didn't tell other people. He used it as an edge in that. So, and I think that's the thing today. We, from a scouting standpoint, we look at five tools that we look for. That's what we ask our scouts to look for. Uh, when it comes to metrics, it, the toughest job right now is to filter through all the noise of the, the numbers and to, to, to determine what are, I keep asking my people and challenging them, what's the five or six most important statistical data that can help us to mesh with the five tools that Scout brings to the table. I think the thing that's very important in our game today that um, down the road to is the medical uh, injuries and staying on top of that because the cost of getting a player and and uh, he doesn't perform for you for certain markets for all markets it's it's uh, can be devastating and that like uh, you know and we're going to probably use some names up here and it doesn't mean we're not we're not being critical of anything but it's just to try to help us all out in learning like the Yankees with Pedro Feliciano two years and I don't think he's going to pitch an inning for him that kind of information is so helpful to all of us. The doctors and trainers have a lot of pressure put on them in trying to make decisions and, uh, and that. So combination, there's a lot of things come into play. It's just not as easy as let's make a trade and it happens in three or four hours. I used to do that with my Stratomatic games, but I can't do it today. Well, there's also something that did not take place in Stratomatic and that's the human element. And what a lot of fans don't realize and even what us in the media or don't realize all the time either is these guys often have things going on in their lives and what is going on in their lives can affect what is being produced at the plate or at the mound wherever and I'm wondering just how much research is still done into makeup and not just makeup but does this guy have a marital thing going on that could distract him does this guy have some children who may be ill because we've seen now 
well, over the years we've seen this, many examples of players who don't perform to a certain level. And it's not an excuse, but there are things going on. How much does that factor in? I, I think it factors in. If I had to, like Doug said, pick the, the five elements or, or, or non-tool related uh, criteria to judge a player, or to, to measure his value, makeup might be number one. And, and may outweigh any of the five physical tools as well. There's, there's so much going on. We all have something going on in our own lives every day. Some days it's easier to do your job than others. Players are no different. You know, in today's day and age, particularly with the advances in social media, we have so many different outlets to, to essentially find out what we need to find out about a player. You know, we'll call it doing your due diligence. At the end of the day, you're relying on your scouts to provide information to get close to the players. You're relying on your staff to, to give you some insight into how these guys are wired, how they tick. Who can you rely on through the years because of work ethic, character, the different things they bring to the table. So, so the, the competition uh, component, I think, exists with most, but there are, there are traits in a player whether it be the desire that I'll call it the will to, the will to win, the will to, uh, the will to beat the opponent at all costs, the will to work. These are, these are things that you can only find out through personal research. But there's, there's no one way to measure it in a metric, but it becomes maybe the most important analysis that you'll, that, that you'll go through or perform in a given year. Now Chris, the Indians under you and before you, Mark, have obviously placed a great emphasis on character. And I'm wondering how you factor that into the predictive models that you were talking about. How do you make that work? Well, to date, we don't. And I think it's always going to be, as Jerry said, it's far more of an art than a science in that respect. You try to understand you know, what makes players tick, what motivates them to, which is a big part of it. Different guys are motive, just like people in all aspects of life, can be motivated by different things. Ultimately, we're looking for players that are motivated by winning and winning collectively and winning the right way. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out guys that fit that profile. And you know, a few years ago, we made <clears throat> a trade with a player who was arguably our best player at the time, Milton Bradley. And it got to a point we tried to work. We tried to work with Milton uh, to allow him to assimilate and fit within our culture. But in the end, it just didn't end up working. And it was at a time in our organization where we made a statement to say, for this reason, this isn't the right fit with us. And so we had to make a change. And despite the fact that he was our best player, it was important enough organizationally to make that change. And candidly, it set us, it set the tone for our organization moving forward about what our expectations were. Players then understood that it was not just about, it wasn't something we just talked about, but it's something that we lived. And so I think for us, it's always a part of what we look for and what we're, when we're trying to acquire players. Doug, you've got one of the most diverse, raucous clubhouses in the game, even without Prince. And you've got a manager who seems to be able to hold it all together. Ron Renneke came from the Angels. Talk about that and how Ron makes it work for your team. You know, one of Ron's uh, great strengths is his relationship with the players. And it's very important that players have confidence in the manager. And I think you have a manager that understands that the game's difficult to play. It is a tough game to play. We played 203 games in 227 days last year. So for anybody to think you're going to be mentally 100% every day going to the park, um, you're fooling yourselves because I'm not 100% every day going to the park. But 203 games in 227 days is, is a grind. And so you got to be upbeat when a player may be hanging his head. And you got to make sure that you're not, you know, creating a, a negative vibe or environment around because the game's tough. Our game, you fail more at our game than any other sport. Now we've obviously seen over the last decade an explosion in the amount of information available. And you guys have access to all of this, access to more than many of us can even imagine. I'm wondering when you go through it, which numbers, which analytics mean the most to you? What do you look at and say, okay, this is where I start? Chris. Well, first off, I rely on people who are a lot smarter than me to help me answer that question. So um, I, I think, as Doug said, that's one of the biggest challenges we have is that there's so much information that's available right now to try to distill down what's most meaningful <coughs> and um, what may be most predictive. Because I think there's a difference between evaluative statistics that tell you what's happened 
which is very, it's informative to know, but ultimately what we care the most about is what's going to happen and what are, what's most predictive. And things that may do the best job explaining what's happened in the past may not be the same things that explain may, what, or may not be the best things to explain what may happen in the future. So we spend our time trying to figure out what are the best predictive metrics. And for obvious reasons, I don't think I'm going the detail as to what those might or might not be, but um, that's where we spend the majority of our time. Let me put it to you like this. Are there numbers that you don't like, mm -hmm. certain statistics that you think, and not batting average, I'm talking about the advanced ones that you think are not as telling as perhaps we may think they are? And yes. if you don't want to answer that, yes, I understand. Yes, there, there are yeah. those numbers, yes. <laughs> All right, maybe this wasn't Jerry, a great Jerry, question. Jerry and uh, Doug can elaborate further if they'd like to. There are outside factors too. For instance, in your case, you guys had just gotten that Fox deal. You've got an owner who's hungry, and he's ready to go. And I imagine maybe at the start of the off season, it wasn't that way. I, I wonder if, how, just that, how that all evolved. That didn't have as big an, an impact on signing Albert Pujols or C.J. Wilson as you might think. I think it was, it was more, more about creating different options, using all the, the information that you have to make decisions, and then creating. If, if we're on the highway toward, toward the, the want or desire to compete for a championship, that highway has many arteries. You know, you, you've got to create different plans, different options based on your own analysis and where your club stands today. 30 clubs are all in a different position and, and each one of them there might be a club that's gearing toward a more competitive level in three years because they chose to build through scouting and development uh, there may be the, I, I think every team and and I've talked about this for a year you have to understand where your where your cores are yeah I, and you're gonna have each team is gonna have multiple cores if you're doing it right you're gonna have a core of players in the big leagues you're gonna have you're gonna have other pockets in the minor leagues and you're building around those cores so we're all going to be, and if you couldn't tell, I'm a bit of an age phobe, which is <laughs> odd considering the offseason I've had. But we've, we, we've, we build cores and we try to move toward that, that group. It, it might be a little different for the San Diego Padres today than it is for the New York Yankees. It might be a little different for the Brewers than it is for the Angels. And, and you attack. You, you attack when it's time based on where you stand in the market. There's a day when trading Dan Heron for, for young left-handed pitching prospects is a smart thing. Mm -hmm. There's also a day when having him on your staff is, is, is a good thing too. So it's, it's never as, as simple as, as operating in a vacuum. And oftentimes, like you said, Kenny, when you open up the, the website and you get on Baseball Think Factory, we're always in a vacuum. And that's not the way life works. That's not the way the game works. All right, Chris. Cleveland, obviously, much different than Los Angeles. You have special challenges in that market. How does that affect the way you go into free agency and the way you use your analytics to just, as Jerry said, attack a core of players? Well, I think, as Jerry said, that one of the key things to recognize is that each of the 30 markets is different. Each, you know, our assessment of Albert Pujols is likely nearly identical to Jerry's assessment of Albert Pujols. He's an exceptional player, and, I mean, that's not anything exceptionally enlightening. The difference is the markets in which we operate. Um, we have to make certain decisions as we look to free agency and how we build our team. We have to do it a little bit differently than, than Jerry does. And Doug has his own way in sp conditions specific to his market and his ownership group. And you know where his team is, it's going to be different than ours. It's going to be different than Minnesota. It's going to be different than the Yankees. So I think that to echo what Jerry said, you, I don't think it's fair to ever look at those free agency decisions in a vacuum. For us, it gets down to we have to find value on the market. We, ha we know we have to build our team through players that come through our system that are either pre-arbitration eligible, arbitration eligible, and then we need to look to free agency to complement that group. We can't build a team through free agency or even have the majority of our production come from free agents. It's just not a reality for our market. So when we go to the market, we're looking for value. We're looking for value. and. One of the ways we try to do that is to have a flexible roster because if we go in and say, okay, we need a third baseman this offseason, and it happens to be the same year that the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Mariners, and the Mets need a third baseman, well, guess what? We're not going to end up in a very good spot. We're going to be, you know, we're going to have to find some other way to solve that problem. So it may lead us to the trade route. It may lead us to maybe play a different player at, at third base that we have and, and try to you know, fill a different hole on our team. So we are very value oriented when we go to the market and we have to be flexible in how we approach it. We, 
you know, we can't just go out there and say, that's the guy we want, that's the guy we're going to get.